and go. All right, well, welcome back. We're on module 16 now. Uh, there on page 29, and we're going to uh, we're going to actually break the, uh, the the laws and regulations into uh, laws, and then FINRA and other self-regulatory organization uh, regulations. So we'll start into the uh, uh, in module 16 into the various laws that Congress has passed. We'll start out with an old friend of ours, the Securities Themselves Act of 1933. And remember, we named it that because that's what it covers, the securities themselves. How do we take this piece of paper that otherwise has no value at all, essentially, and turn it into something that people will part with their hard-earned money to buy because it has value as a marketable security? That's what the Securities Themselves Act of 1933 covers. Of the two years, it's the primary year. It covers the primary market. Okay. The secondary year, 1934, it's going to cover secondary market transactions. We'll cover it in just a second. But uh, registration of new securities, remember we talked about those exempt securities. If you're not familiar with those, go back and review. But the way to remember is the government regulator, list of charities is short. That's a good way to remember what are exempt securities. And exempt means the rules do not apply. Never, ever, ever does an anti-fraud rule not apply to anything. I don't care who you are, what you're selling, if there's fraud involved, it's fraud. You can't get around that. And, um, and then the, um, uh, we've had exempt transactions as well, specifically <coughs> intrastate transactions and private placements. Those are the ones you're likely to see on this test. Preliminary and then final or statutory prospectuses are required. Uh, with disclaimer, the, 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 uh, neither the SEC nor any state administrator approves or disapproves of those. To cut to the chase scene, if you represent, make a representation to the contrary, it's a criminal offense. That's on every prospectus in the world. All right? That's the, the highlights of the 33 Act. And again, you can go back and pick that up in the new issues section. Once those securities get out into the marketplace, though, we have other requirements that are imposed by the, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. In fact, let's rename that one. Securities, comma, exchange thereof, Act of 1934. Because the first is the securities themselves. Then we go to the exchange thereof. So it's in the secondary marketplace that the 1934 Act applies. Uh, the interesting thing is that the, the 34 Act created the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now let's figure this one out, okay? The 33 Act required non-exempt securities that come to market in non-exempt transactions to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission. But the Securities and Exchange Commission wasn't even created until 1934. What did you do in the meantime? I don't know. It's just, that's Congress for you. You know, sometimes they do kind of kind of strange stuff. So anyway, we'll give them a break this time. Uh, there are numerous provisions, but... If you take the big picture view, what does the 34 Act want to do? It wants to prevent fraud and promote fair dealings. It wants to make a level playing field for everybody. Is it okay to lose money in the stock market? You don't like it, but it happens. It's okay. Is it okay to be cheated out of money in the stock market? Not no, but you know what? No. All right. That's where the 34 Act comes into play. And then included in its provisions are the catch-all fraud rule, which basically says that, that you know, if, if you are clever enough to come up with some way to defraud someone that we haven't thought about and we didn't address it, you know what? It doesn't matter. If it's fraud, it's covered. So I, I don't care how clever you are, you cannot get around and skirt around the, the letter of the law and wind up with the net effect of, of defrauding someone and have it not be fraud. Uh, then you have uh, market manipulation was prohibited by the, uh, the 34 Act. A lot of these terms, the way that technology has evolved and the way that the, the volume in the marketplaces has evolved, they really don't make any sense. So what you need to do to understand these things is to take technology out of the picture and scale your, your volume on, for instance, the New York Stock Exchange, way, way, way down. Okay? And so, uh, so like, for instance, wash trades. That's where... I decide to buy something, and then I turn around and sell it. But then I buy it 10 minutes later, and I turn around and sell it again. And I buy it 10 minutes later, and I turn around and sell it again. The net effect is nothing, but what did I just do? I just created a bunch of volume that now shows up, and if there's low, low volume, I can make a difference. 
Well, that's manipulation. Or trading pools is another thing where I buy, sell to you, sell to you, sell to you, sell to you, sell to me, sell to you, sell to you, sell to you, and we just pass it around. It does the same thing. It's called painting the tape. It's really hard to paint the tape when you've got volume like we have now. Okay. But you can do that. Short tenders. When a company makes a tender offer, tender is just a fancy word for send it in. So they make a send it in offer. And we don't have the stuff, but we tender it anyway. Okay? I, one of these days I'm going to figure out how you made money on that. But it's manipulation. It's fraud. It's prohibited. That's the important thing for our purposes. Okay? The exchange and members all have to register. Exchanges under the 34 Act became self-regulatory organizations or SROs. So FINRA is not a government entity. It is an independent entity. However, it, it has to answer to the SEC because the SEC has delegated out those day-to-day -day enforcement of the intention of the 34 Act to the self-regulatory organization. So, uh, so basically, that's, that's the deal with FINRA. Uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, they passed the 34 Act, and then they said, oh my gosh, we forgot all about over-the-counter trading. So the Maloney Act, three or four years later, five years later, uh, it, that's, uh, that, that's the act that actually made the NASD, National Association of Security Dealers, <clears throat> it made NASD a self-regulatory organization. NASDR for regulation uh, and then New York Stock Exchange regulation merged to become FINRA later on. But I'd be familiar with the, the Maloney Act and what it did. It made the NASD a self-regulatory organization. So members, which are the companies, members of exchanges, members of NASD, they have to register and as do affiliated persons. Affiliated persons, basically anybody who's going to involve themselves in a trade. Anywhere along the line, they'll have to register. Uh, corporate reporting requirements. This was huge in 1934 because basically before that time, uh, you know, hey, I, I own stock in this company. What's it doing? It's none of your darn business. That's a trade secret. But I own it. I don't care. You got a big mouth. You're going to blab it. That's no way to do business. So now we have to have 10 Qs and 10 Ks that are filed with the SEC. The 10 Q. Uh, appropriately is a quarterly report. The 10K, let's see, let's uh, 10K, there we go, and let's see what this says. This says, how many times do you file a 10K? Once per year, it's annually. And what's the difference between it and a 10Q? Well, the 10K is audited. So what do the auditors say about the report? They say, it's okay, we're going to sign off on it. So there's our 10 Qs and 10 Ks. Uh, Regulation T. Now we talked about this just kind of in passing uh, way back when we were talking about customer accounts because we said that Regulation T of the Federal Reserve Board set up the, uh, uh, the dates by which folks, individual investors or, or the, the, the retail uh, or institutional traders have to, um, uh, have to deliver or pay for trades. Now the settlement dates are established by the SROs. But the actual payment date or delivery date is set up by the Federal Reserve Board under Regulation T as, as settlement date plus two. We kind of said that kind of leaves your broker dealers out hanging in the breeze for two days. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's just the way it works. Now, what happens if I don't pay or don't deliver by that Reg T deadline? Well, what happens is that at that time, as a customer, I can request that my broker dealer place a request for a Reg T extension. Yeah, that's three days, you don't have to know that. But they can request an extension. The important thing is that it really it's supposed to be limited to exceptional circumstances. Okay? The exchanges then may grant the extension. Does your broker dealer have to request the extension? No. They can say, look, Bubba. You know the rules. I'm either going to sell you out or else I'm going to you know, buy you back in. You know, so whatever I have to do, and you're going to owe the difference. Okay? But if they do request the extension, does the, does the exchange have to grant? No. No. Exceptional circumstances, okay? But assuming that they do, then the customer has that additional time 
uh, to deliver or to pay, but if they fail to pay, either by the deadline with no extension or the end of the extension period, then the account is frozen. Now, frozen means cold and hard, right? Yeah. So what do you have to do if your account is frozen? Can you do any trades in your account? Absolutely. But you got to have cold, hard cash on the barrel head right there in the account before you buy anything. And you got to have those securities in I can absolutely cold, hard fact I can deliver these securities to the other broker dealer. They have to be long in your account before you enter the trade to sell. So yes, you can do that. And for 90 days, it's cold hard cash or cold hard fact, one or the other, depending on whether you're buying or selling. And then commingling of member assets and customer assets is prohibited under the 34 Act. So still kind of, you know, covering those provisions of the 34 Act. Commingling just sounds bad. Okay. And, and it is, because the thing is that, that the, the, the broker-dealer's assets, uh, that's used to determine the financial strength of the broker-dealer. And the broker-dealer does not own the customer assets. The, the, the broker-dealer has custody of those assets, but they belong to the customers. So if, if you go to commingling those, uh, that you're going to wind up counting customer assets and showing it as a strength of the broker-dealer. It's actually a liability of the broker-dealer. So, uh, so, like I say, no commingling of assets. And then insider trading is prohibited. What we're going to find in a second is insider transactions are quite okay. It happens all the time. It needs to happen. Okay? Insider trading is prohibited because insider trading, uh, first of all, the technical definition of insiders is officers, directors, and 10% shareholders. That's what's in the 34 Act. All right? Over the years, courts have then expanded that to include anyone who's in possession of material, non-public information. Material, it can reasonably expected, be expected to move the price of the, the stock. Non-public, we haven't told the media yet. We haven't re had a news release. Once there's a news release, it's assumed that dissemination of that information is instantaneous. Buy, sell, whatever you want to do, because everybody get, has the information at that point. Okay. So the courts, like I say, expanded that, and, uh, and then that was put into the code. It's codified by the uh, Insider Trading and Securities Fraud Enforcement Act, ITSFEA. Just remember, IT stands for insider trading, and don't worry about the rest of it. But, uh, but that expanded that definition to anyone with enough material, non-public information. Uh, the tippers and tippees, it doesn't matter if you're blabbing or if you're listening and acting, whatever. Okay you're going to be equally liable on either side. Uh, criminal penalties up to a million dollar fine, up to 10 years in prison. Civil penalties, disgorgement of the ill-gotten gains. And it really doesn't matter if you made money or if you avoided a loss. The one is just the same as the other. And so if they're, e they're equally bad. And so you'd, you'd have to give up that money. Plus then treble damages, you know, like a treble hook if you're a fisher person. Uh, you know, a treble hook has three hooks. Yeah, it hooks you long, deep, and wide, you know? And uh, so three times that amount on the civil damages. Uh, then uh, contemporaneous traders is a term we need to remember. Think about this, okay? Let's say that you bought a stock based on insider information. If I had had that same insider information, would I have sold? Well, no. You had it and you bought. I would have at least held, maybe even bought some more. So the thing is, you actually bought it from someone and, you know, you harmed that person because you acted illegally and took it away from them and cheated them out of the opportunity to make that gain that you made. The thing is, we can go back and we can find exactly when that, that took place and sure enough, there you go, we can find the other side of the trade and you cheated Bob. But you know what? What about Fred and Sally and Sue and Mary and Jane and Sa and Sa hey, all these people in through here that, that also sold? Is it worth it to find out who really, really was on the other side? No. All these folks are contemporaneous traders. You heard all of them. All of them. Okay. Do I hear a class action lawsuit? Yeah, there we go. Anyway, be that as it may, uh, that's, that's contemporaneous traders and what we've got. So the Chinese walls, another provision of ITSFEA in particular. Now what this is, okay, is the, that 
The investment banking, remember that term from back on new issues? The investment banking department of your broker dealer, they've got a loading dock and trucks back up and take off, you know, like pallets of, of paper and office supplies and insider information. And, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, that's what they do. I mean, they've got to have that insider information in order to conduct business. Having it is not a crime. Sharing it or acting on it is. All right? So if we, by necessity, have to come into possession of insider information, then can we tell that to anybody else? No. We build that wall around our little department and we use that information strictly for the benefit of our client. And that's it. That's as far as it goes. Now we'll revisit that in just a second. In fact, right here it is. What do you do if you get some insider information? If, there's the, if you're a member of the public, there are three things that you do, okay? First of all, you zip it. Second, you lock it. And the third thing, you throw away the key. You don't share it. You don't act on it. That's it. it. It will, until it becomes public, if you die, it'll go to the grave with you. That is in compliance with the law. Zip it, lock it, throw away the key. But what about you? If you come into possession of non-public information, material non-public information, then there are four things that you need to do. The first thing is you need to tell your principal. Tell your principal boss, hey man, I am in possession of this material non-public information. And then, you know what you do? You zip it, you lock it, you throw away the key. That keeps you in compliance. Had one guy said, well, what if my principal acts on it? You will be the primary witness for the prosecution in the insider trading top trial of your principal. Okay? You did the right thing. If you do the right thing, you don't have to worry about it. That's the right thing for you. So, the question has shown up. If someone gets has possession of material non-public information, do they tell the research department? No. Why? Violation of two rules. First of all, ITSFEA, but secondly, it's a violation of the Chinese wall principle. Likewise, you know, do you tell the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the trading desk? No. No. You tell your principal and then you shut the heck up, okay? And don't act on it, don't tell anybody. But watch for that, you go to your direct principal, the person who supervises you, and that's it. The others violate both of those principles. Insider transactions now, wholly different story. You know, tuition bills come due for, for officers, directors, 10% shareholders, and spouses, just like they do for Bob, okay? I've got to sell some stock. I've got to buy some stock. I mean, I've got a bonus. It's good when, a, when an officer buys stock in the company he's an officer for. It shows that he has trust in it. But can't do anything in secret, so those have to be reported to the, the SEC within two business days. All right. And at this point, we get into the um, uh, go away from the 34 Act and into some of these other acts like the Investment Company Act of 1940. And we actually talked about those provisions uh, earlier, where it talks about the, the creation, the registration, operation of investment companies, uh, what you have to do to, to form one, uh, uh, you know, maintaining the, uh, the uh, all redemptions at net asset value, uh, maximum sales charts, all those things are covered by the Investment Company Act of 1940. So rather than rehash those, like I say, those are back in previous modules. Uh, we do then start to, uh, to get into some of the, the other uh, the laws that we haven't talked about quite as much. So uh, let's call this then a natural breaking point, and, and let's stop this uh, video. We'll come back then and wrap up on the rest of this information on the next video. We'll see you in a few minutes.